Welcome. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Um, I'm Shia, and I'm going to read from these a little bit. Um, we are gathered here tonight to learn about the ties between science, music, and society. We're also celebrating the first birthday of the Live Music Project. <laughs> if anyone here knows about the live music project. Instead, I'll ask, does anyone not know about the live music project? Yay, awesome. So the next sentence gets to be read. Um, <laughs> the live music project is a community calendar for classical and contemporary music in Seattle. You may or may not know that there are more than 150 orchestras and ensembles here, and they've all come together to put all of their performances onto one single calendar, which is pretty incredible. Um, this is also a celebration of you. Since I started this project, I've come across so many wonderful people who contribute to our community in creative, generous, and inspiring ways. Musicians, engineers, administrators, writers, designers, you're amazing, and now you're all in one room together. Wow. So go nuts. <laughs> But maybe wait until after the lecture to really go nuts. Um, it wouldn't be a birthday party without presents, so we'll have a drawing for door prizes, prizes later this evening. Uh, and they're pretty fun. A few thank yous to the orchestras who have welcomed me among their crowded ranks. I'm grateful and honored. For our door prizes, the Seattle Philharmonic Orchestra, the Early Music Guild, the Seattle Baroque Orchestra, LUCO, Seattle Symphony, and Music of Remembrance. Thanks also to Professor Toluca for agreeing to speak, to Terry Cook and Chris Warswick for tonight's concert, to Carol Snyder for underwriting tonight's concert, and Adas for having us in this beautiful space. And with now, with no further ado, Professor Vladimir Toluca from the University of Washington. first this and then I will tell you this. No, I will just tell you, instead of telling you what I will tell you. <laughs> the reason is that I, I, I've worked on this stuff for 40 years. I can give uh, this lecture in 40 hours, but I got 40 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so I hope it will not be confused. It will be, uh, I hope it will be, uh, I, I, but we'll see, you will be the judges of that. So uh, let's get started. Uh, this is, I, I love celebrations. The, I celebrate Bach in Duval every day as you can see, and the deer uh, and God, they don't care, they just play, but the bear is paying attention, so maybe even the bear is musical, oh, he's looking at me and see, ah, dinner, <laughs> and then say, oh, let's give him, <laughs> give him some more time to get some more weight, so anyway, uh, <laughs> people joking at the beginning, what is important for you is that uh, you can get all of this and more, you can meet alone more than you ever wanted to know about all of this on my web page, not yet, because you have changed the servers and I'm starting from scratch, so it, it, I'll build it up, but this lecture will be there, it is there tonight already, so we're going to come home, and by Monday I should have the promised book, at least this draft of this chapter, this chapter, so you can have a look at it and maybe criticize or uh, whatever you want to uh, comment or suggest. So, WW, it makes sense, faculty, I'm faculty, Washington, everybody, it's amazing. See, this identifies me and makes so much sense. No, no addresses like, which don't make sense, like numbers. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so, so, our celebration, actually, as you know, from the introduction starts a little before Bach, because our first uh, guy who we will celebrate is uh, much older, Cedar BC. And uh, we will celebrate everything, but after Einstein and a bit Einstein, actually, our celebration will acquire a little tinge of worry and, and uh, really despair, almost. But because this is celebration, I will not talk about it. I will mention it because that's what I do. Thanks, say humanity, my free time from itself. 
but I will not talk about it today. I will mention what it is very briefly. So, so let's start. One day, more than 2,500 years ago, Professor Pythagoras was not satisfied with this triangle, which you all had in the class, and uh, most of you hated, right? It's like such a terrible <laughs> thing, A squared plus B squared plus C squared. Uh, but it made him immortal. <laughs> this single triangle made him immortal. He was not satisfied with not even with the irrational numbers, which had made him also immortal. And we will talk about it a little bit. But he was not satisfied with this, so he set up to investigate why some musical intervals are consonant and why they are dissonant. And believe it or not, it made him also immortal. And it's not very well known, so that's why I want to emphasize it. And it's about music. But let's go first to the triangle. What the heck do you think triangle has to do with music? Okay. And let's start with the triangle. Here's the right triangle, right? And uh, opposite sign and adjacent and have then you send this over the sine cosine and this square plus this square is equal to this square everybody knows this right so grammar is very very stupid so here you have it and then you say okay let's see if this has any connection with vibration triangle and vibration to illustrate this, have a look at my first experiment. It's extremely sophisticated because in physics department we only do extremely sophisticated things. Okay, this is the experiment. <laughs> it's a spring and there's a mass and it vibrates, you see? Nothing could be simpler than that, right? Yet I can spend easily, easily one hour with students to explain them all the subtle things, you see? Because this is equilibrium, everybody is happy, right? This is not equilibrium, why? The mass is at rest, but the string is not rest. So it would like to push again, and it will come to equilibrium of position of the string, but now the mass is moving, so it's not happy. And then you see, what you see here is two things which are out of phase by 90 degrees. It reminds me of typical marriage, no. <laughs> I don't, don't say anything to my wife. <laughs> you see, it's, it, it's energy of the kinetic motion and, and potential energy of the spring and they are happy at different times and unhappy and therefore when this thing is happy, the inertia of the mass keeps it moving, you see, and this whole thing interplays like this. And when you think about it a little bit and uh, look at it, but you cannot see what I will show you because your angle is wrong and your angle, you see, so you have to imagine it imagine but this is often better than seeing it so imagine that you are looking at it like this and i have a wheel here and you are looking at it side on the wheel goes like this from your point of view and on that wheel there's a bright uh, uh, light bulb and we stick up the light and you are looking at what is going on you don't see anything rotating what you see is the bulb going up and down up and down like this but it doesn't go up and down, up and down uniformly, you see? Because when it goes down, what is driving it is diminishing. And therefore the degree of going up is slowing down and momentarily becomes at rest at the extreme. And it goes down and momentarily comes at the extreme. And the same with velocity. Velocity is opposite. When the, uh, when the position has happy because it's the medium, velocity is happy is the maximum. And therefore it shows you without any much more calculus. This is, this is it, that if you make a projection of circular motion into one dimension, which is against you, and you look at it, it will exactly approximate the motion up and down, goes up with maximum velocity, slow, 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 stop, comes to rest. And then changes its mind and starts to fall down, 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 acquire the velocity, maximum velocity is in the middle, and you can see it, just look at this. This is the vector of velocity, and you have imagination. As th this thing circles, the yellow thing has constant size because it's constant velocity around the circle. But what you see is the projection of it. And if, if I am here, you see, there's a large velocity, but you don't see that because in the dark, this light bulb seems momentarily at rest. You see? Eh? And therefore, you see that the whole motion is described by this, and by this, and by this. And if this is position and this is velocity, if you multiply it by some constant, which I do not bore you with, it would take us half an hour, but you can do it very fast. You see? And you will find out. There's too many gadgets here. <laughs> you 
do try now that you will have a squared which is x squared with some constant plus b squared if a constant but since this is potential energy of the spring which is there when it's compressed or this this so and since this kinetic energy so you don't know what this means this constant but since this is energy and this is also energy this cannot be anything else but energy. also energy namely total energy and you have in 600 bc he didn't do it this way but this is all inherent in his simple simplistic idiotic triangle <laughs> and a squared plus b squared plus c squared is the law of conservation of energy and this is the foundations of all physics and this is also the foundations of all vibrations you see because and that which is foundation of music because in all vibrations this this string the column of air in the orbital pipe the vibration which follows the same principles and it's beauty of physics not to look for complicated things but beauty of physics to look for simple things to find pleasure in them and see like a poet said to see the whole world in the grain of sand. And so I can show you, I can talk about this at great length, not today, but and it's not boring. <laughs> it's not boring, and the, the beautiful thing about doing it this way, you see, the physics student never heard a physics professor talk to them like this because it's been years, and they worried. Ah. And, and so, so they never heard it, they're interested. And yet you didn't lose the dumb physicists because they don't, you understand what I was saying, right? More or less. <laughs> and therefore you can have a class in which physicists sit in the same room as non-physicists and everybody is learning. And when there is a discussion there, they discuss and everybody is learning not only from me, but also from each other. And this is what, what I, I, I am, I tell my students, At moments like this, when it seems I'm bragging too much, you say, no, I said, no, no, no. I'm very modest. In fact, I'm the most modest professor by far. <laughs> <laughs> by far, I <laughs> See, so I, But this is the secret of the second branch of, of uh, teaching, which is often neglected. Teaching that we either uh, doing instruction. I instruct you in calculus, you in uh, quantum physics. I'm trans, uh, tra transmitting in my knowledge. But the mo much more important part of uh, education is of, of uh, teaching is education. You see, and this is education. When you educate people to see depths when they would not expect to. Okay, let's proceed. In our celebration, <laughs> Professor Pythagoras, rational numbers. You see, rational numbers. What is the that is boring thing? And what has to do with music? So what? The rational number is n over m, and n is a finite integer, and also like three two, three three halves, one point five, seven fourths, one point seventy five, etc. etc. There is a little, little kind of complication here. All of them, as you see, has fine a finite number of these. One point five. That's it. One point seventy five. That's it. So we be tempted to say it must have finite number of digits. If it doesn't, it's irrational. Not true. What is 25, 21 over 7,000? It's a rational number, it's a ratio of two integers. When you take your calculator mm -hmm. with enough decimal points, you will see it's, it's like this and it never ends. It never ends. But then you look a bit closer and you will see after a few seconds that this figure, 142857, 142.85, repeats. You see? And therefore, you, have, you can have numbers, in fact, most of them are like that they do, they do have infinite number of digits, but they repeat at some level. You see, and you see what, how important it is in a split second. But anyway, it was truly devastating for Pythagoras' school. <laughs> truly devastating when one of them we discovered that square root of two, number of which square is two, is not, cannot be expressed as n over n. Uh, m over n. See, and there are stories about it, and probably most of them uh, apocryphal, but the stories are that the, the guy was executed who discovered it because he, he completely shattered the worldview of all them. You see, they worship the rational rations, that's why we call it rational. Rations come first, and rationally call it rational because they worship it as being worthy of our, you see. And now it was gone. It was gone, square root of two. You see, and you, you find it. 
you did is fantastic stuff, squirt of two. Look at this, nothing repeats. And you can see at this precision, it is a rational number. It, this humongous, humongous, it's <laughs> by by But the secret is that this never ends. You see, this never ends. You see, and now it comes, you, you will appreciate this bit here, you see. If you want to prove that this is irrational, you must prove that after billions, trillions, quadrillions, zillions of numbers, there is no place after which there is billions, 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 and then after more bit, they will start to repeat. You can never do it by inspection. You see? So, so it's a big deal. It reminds me of when I teach it, oh, this is so kind of boring, right? But it's not boring because it reminds me of girls. Uh, undecidabilities, which basically in plain English says that there are truths that cannot be proven. And he proved it. <laughs> I will pause now. Everybody should now get a headache because unless you get a headache, you did not survive that talking about. Very severe, make my girl headache. You see, he proved that there are some truths which cannot be proven. So, how can he prove it? It's a bit crazy, but it's true. It's true. He was the same. Oh, I'm getting carried away. Right. <laughs> <laughs> he, 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 he was a countryman and, and a fellow traveler of uh, Albert Einstein. Same age, same origin from India. Escaped from, from uh, Nazism, ended up in Princeton. And one of them did the revolution in physics. And one of them uh, in math, but most people only learn about physics because it's more sexy. Physics, <laughs> this and that, but you know, the, the side of this and that. But he also transformed mathematics because he learned. But but you can see all examples prove to how big deal it is. So it's a big deal. And uh, for that matter, we just have pi day. Pi is also not rational. And to prove that pi is not rational is difficult. So I will not. Imposes on you. But I will claim to you <coughs> that proof that square root of two is not rational should be in what I call intellectual toolbox of everyone, of musicians and poets, and every, because it's possible to do. In fact, if I had 10 more minutes, I could do it for you, but it's, it's, on, uh, it's in the, uh, it will be on the website. And if you, will, if, you, if you then realize what you will have just proven that never. This, this will never, after zillion, billion years, in the next million years, you know, never the sequence will start repeating itself and never will stop. Never. You will understand what Gettle's here. This is the same level of thing. So you, 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 you must agree that this uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> 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 Okay, so <laughs> music. We will now go to the second incredibly sophisticated experiment here which will, which will bring us to that point thank you I have an assistant you hold the table because the table is shaky and I don't have a catastrophe here <laughs> so this is a uh, rubber rope uh, under tension, which is probably by 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 uh, weight, and I will disturb it periodically by this pin, <coughs> which is in rotating disc and it's off center. You see, so every time the pin goes like this, pin will create a little kick on on the and the same thing with this one, and I will we only change the frequency of those kicks. The magnitude of each kick is given by the off eccentricity of the pin. If the pin had been at the center, there would be no kick. And since this is fixed, <coughs> I will be disturbing like this, or like this, but over the same amount. See, like if you have a child on a swing and you, you do it like this, or like this, mm -hmm. or like this, see, that's how I'll be doing it. And you will see, uh, it starts with uh, uninterestingly because it, the vibration at low frequency is kind of feeble, pitiful, non regular uh, da. When I speed it up, and I, I repeat, this is extremely important. I'm not increasing the amount of disturbance, only the timing. Still, but you can see some, ah, you can see. At the right frequency, you have a very large vibration with simple, with simple shape, namely we have what we call a node here, 
a node here and anti node here. There's a maximum vibration here. It's a beautiful half of wavelengths, you see. So let's do it again, but I will pass it quickly and then I'll see what happens when you increase the frequency even more. Okay, let's do it again. So this is the first mode of vibration. And again, it's feeble, I mean, between modes, right? It's feeble and nonsensical. But at the right frequency, which is higher now. Yeah, there is a second mode which has one more node. This one has one, two, three nodes, right? I exaggerate some more, and again, you, I lose it. Faster and faster and faster. Double mode. <laughs> it's doubling between. Oh, so this next mode, which is one more node. And do you know what happens if I go even faster? It'll break. Ah, who, said, who said it? Who said it? I said it'll break. Yes, you are right. <laughs> you stole my punch. <laughs> you warned us the Einstein theory at the end, the atomic bomb, you know. <laughs> yes, uh, it's it like the break uh, and, and uh, the deflation would. Can you demonstrate that again from mm -hmm. scratch? Do you mind? You want me to break it? Okay. <laughs> I, I, I want to film the differences, if that's okay, by here. Playing with fire here. <laughs> uh. Thank you. Thank you. And this, you know, that's the foundation of all music. You see, because when you have arbitrary, uh, arbitrary motion, arbitrary motion of this, it's a little bit of this mode, plus a little bit of this mode, plus a little. And this is explained here. You may think that to calculate the frequency and the second and third, it might be very difficult. But not again, you see. It is child's uh, piece of cake. If you do it properly, look at this, we will do it together. And you may, you may need to redo it at home with the help of transparencies. What is the relationship between lengths of the prometer there? And the wavelength. Wavelength is from here to here, from one uh, from one zero to the second zero, or from one crest to the second, simply from two places between two places of the of the same phase. You see, so wavelength would be from here, from here to there. It's almost the same, right? What is the relationship? Wavelengths would be this wavelength would be like this and down. You see. So this will be the full wavelength, but this is like. And therefore, this full length for the first mode is one half of the wavelength. Okay, clear? Mm -hmm. This is not full wavelength, this is one half. Mm -hmm. What is this? Full wavelength. This is full wavelength. But for reasons of hindsight, I will not call it full wavelength, but two half wavelengths. Mm -hmm. Same thing. Mm -hmm. Because what is the third one? Okay. Yeah. One, two, three. Three halves. What is the fourth one? Four halves, and now you don't have to be a rocket scientist to see that the general formula that the ends mode, the lengths and wavelengths of the n mode, it ends mode is coupled by L equal n, like 10 times wavelengths of tenth mode. You see, it's one, two, three, four. And since wavelength is inversely proportional to frequency, you can see, you can see that if the frequency of this is F1, then frequency of this must be one half, two as one, no, twice as one, because if you have larger, if you have small wavelength, this means larger frequency, okay? Three as one, four as one, and you have the Fourier series, and you have calculated just in front of your eyes, everything as it is. If you want more math, I will do it, and it's all here, but I don't want to go through it. Well, maybe, maybe I'll briefly. 
again, if you give me some kind of advice of a good professor, you see, in physics, difficulty is never in something which is very, very difficult. But in, in something is construction of one, two, three, four, five steps, each of them is easy. Mm -hmm. But to go from first to last without going patiently through them is miraculously un understandable difficulty, see? So if you go through this, what is wavelength? Go to your plain English. Wavelength is the length which the wave travels in one period, right? And then if the speed is v, the length is v times t. And, and so you go and if you work your way through this, you will find out, uh, and I will interview by the way, you will obtain the summary of this, which I call important far-reaching result, that the nth mode of this, and the frequency n times frequency to fundamental, whatever this is, if this F1 was 100 hertz, this one will be 200, this one will be 300, 400, 500, etc. And the, the F1 is given by velocity of propagation of the king on the string, king, king, and uh, length, and the velocity is square root of tension which is given by this mass over mass density of this thing. My friends, this is physics of music right in front of you a month back. I spent most of my thing, but whole quarter just to explain this, to, to elaborate on what happens by, by look at this. If you have a violin, you want to change the pitch, what do you change first of all? Length with your finger. And you can see if you increase the length or decrease, you decrease or increase the, 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 the pitch, you, you can see it. If you if you change the velocity, how you change the velocity? If you increase tension, how you increase the tension on violin? Back here. How do, you, what do you, how do you play with mu, which is mass density? Look at it, take, open the piano, and you will see the top strings are very thin, and the top strings are so massive that they are even wrapped around, you see? Because you, you have to go to low frequency, so mu, which is mass, must be large. So all of this is very easy, but very, very, very beautiful. Mm -hmm. And you can actually see, you see the, the greatest this uh, reward which one can get from teaching like this is that after all students come to you and say, teacher, <laughs> I'm empowered now. Because that's what empowers people, not to, to learn something, but to learn how to learn, how to think about it on their own. Mm -hmm. So this is a very beautiful, beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. But anyway, and this is far-reaching implication on, on consonants and dissonance. Look at this typical spectrum. This is a frequency, and this is F1, 2F1, 3F1. This is a frequency this way. And this particular instrument has not much energy in fundamental. So this is like this, much more in this, much more in it. And then, so, so you see, this is like a cooking recipe of how much each mode contributes to the tone. And this whole profile determines what the color or timbre of the instrument. And this is obviously instrument with different pitch because the distance from here to there, which is F1, is larger, you see. And so it is a higher pitch. And also different instrument because this profile is different. You see, here we have most of this. So this will be some, something like maybe piano or voice, and this will be maybe flute or some dull pipe. You see, <laughs> two different instruments. So it's just for exercise. But imagine that the ratio of this frequency to this frequency is one of the Pythagorean ratios. Let's fix three over two. Three over two. Okay. So what is this? If this is 200, this is 300, and this is 600, and this is 600 because, as I say often in my jocular mode, there's a chaluka. Bloody Chalka law, and the law says that three times two is two times three. <laughs> Agree? <laughs> yeah. But when you, when you interpret it, voices in musical terms, it's far from trivial. What does it mean? It means, if you look at this, that third partial of the bottom tone coincides with the second partial of the top tone. Okay? And therefore, they are not false against each other, as we will see in a minute. So, so this is explained here. See, this. So, uh, the same thing is true for this and this. And then this <coughs> is far away from this on, uh, or this to be dissonant. Mm -hmm. This is a sense of the whole consonant and dissonant problem. There are external problems and exceptions and all, but if you don't understand this, 
you don't understand anything. You, 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 you must start with this. And to illustrate this, only acoustically, I have here a torture instrument. <laughs> if I do only this, in one tone, this is it. And this is second tone. Are they the same? Wait a minute. They do it together. Same. If I play them at the same time, they beat. Yeah. And they beat the phenomenon of beat again. This is one of the things which are so simple. This is one of them. This is the second one of them. You look at them, they look similar, but if you superimpose them, you see that one of them is slightly faster than the other one. Mm -hmm. Slightly higher pitch. And therefore, after some time, if they are in agreement here, and therefore the addition of this plus this is this, etc., they got. They get an opposite and they cancel. And you go who, 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 who. And frequency of this who, 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 which is frequency of the beat, is the difference between F2 and F1. You see, and therefore, if, if, I, if I do this and this, oh, <laughs> I, I touch the wrong button. Oh. And then I do this. You cannot tell me which one is higher, which one is lower. But you can tell me that the difference between them is what? About 120 hertz, maybe? The difference? Four. About three, three point five, four, something like four hertz. You see, mystery between them. And now uh, let's listen to what happens when I increase that mystery, you see, because if the mystery is such that you can mentally, in your very brain, count the beats, it's okay. In fact, in, in some field like in organ music, you expect beats. If you if you produce artificial organ, which is so perfect that there are no beats, people will say, oh, that's very nice. Oh, by the way, it's a computer. <laughs> you immediately reject this, so you expect things like this. So this is fine, okay? <coughs> and when the two tones are very far away with frequency, it's also fine. You just hear two tones. It's not very nice here because this is a physics oscillator, not instrument, but it's still painful, but it's okay. But let's listen what happens when it's in between. Still okay? <laughs> and this is bad, you see? And then you keep increasing it. And now it's okay, it's unpleasant because it's a trailer, but it, it's okay. And this is, this now explains everything between them, between them two different. Because how the process by which this maximized con contrast is this nominally is exactly with this. If this is thousand, this is also thousand, it doesn't beat. If the instrument is slightly mistuned, it beats, but only a little. It's not yet in the range, in the which is okay. On the other hand, this and this are so far away from each other that, that they are already far enough. You see? And therefore, this prescription of Pythagoras from 600 BC maximizes this consonant by taking this. If you have to have imagination again, like the biggest smile of my hand is one spectrum, fundamental, secular, and this is second, you see? And they, if you listen to it, they are like this. This not can happen, happen between any two pairs, between this and this and this, you see? And this minimizes the dissonance between any pair of anything. You see, it's not between fundamental. It's any pair of the whole forest which accompanies the, the, the tone. And therefore, you, see, you, you say, well, this is pretty good, right? And consequences are far-reaching. <coughs> Any periodic sound, as I explained here, is some of the harmonics. In the first approximation, if you change the amounts of them, you increase loudness. There's more of it. So if you increase every peak equally, by equal fraction, you have a louder sound of the same color and of the same pitch. But if you change the frequency, 
you change the pitch that you perceive, and if you change the proportions, you change the timbre of some color. All physics of music is here, and if you have also very small integer ratio, is a consonant and how consonant? Well, it depends how small the N and M are. What is the most consonant interval musicians? Sixth. Third. Okay. Sixth. Third or sixth? Most consonant? Most consonant, yes. Or unison. Unison. How consonant is one to one? So it's not small. And how it's bad. It's, it's boring, right? Right. What is the next one? <coughs> two to one. Okay. You see, what is the next one? Three to two is the perfect fix. And so we go. And as you. It's basically then a question of taste. When the integers become high enough for the consonants to be declared dissonant, you see, but certainly 3 to 2 is a fifth, which is very consonant, and 19 to 13 is certainly dissonant, you see, because there, who cares that 19 uh, listen to this, it's also chow chow chow. 19 times 13 is certainly equals 13 times 19, isn't it? But what does it mean in, in, in physics? Nine, every 19th multiple of the bottom tone coincides with every 13th of the top tone, nothing else. Who cares? Because this doesn't care what other partial sub you see. And that's why the degree of consonants goes, goes down with the increasing value of those small integers. And so we look at the, uh, look at the spectrum now. Uh, spectrum zero, I do ah. Uh, Unbeknownst to you, what is present in my A ah is F, which is the pitch of the tone, 2F, 3F. If you and you and you do A, ah, it will be different proportions because you have different color. <coughs> but my, my voice, A, ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> what is this? Interval between this and this. Inside this, what you hear right now, A, ah, you know what you hear in there? Unbeknownst <coughs> to you, until today, A. Ah. <laughs> An octave. You hear an octave, ah, what is between this and this? Seven. It's a fifth. What is between this and this? It's fourth. What is between this and this? Between fourth harmonic and, two, and second harmonic? Oh, octave. What is between this and this? Another fifth. Now imagine that a small baby is just be, be born this minute. Or maybe even before it's born. And, I could make baby dog. Can somebody make a uh, uh, sub baby dog for, for me? Oh, oh please. <laughs> no, no, that's not bad. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. That was good. Ah, what a beautiful. Oh In that ah, what the baby hears, unbeknownst to her, is the whole uh, spectrum of intervals. It's an octave, second octave, fourth. Always in the even in the whole the whole major chord in there because when you compose when you put major on minor chord on top of each other like that so the whole major chord is in ah uh, like this. And this is physics. This is not the biology, but biology is only some subfield of physics, of course. <laughs> <laughs> and so when, the, when somebody tells you that Western music is such because of Western culture, no, 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 no. It's most interesting and far from trivial job for a researcher to put his or her finger where is the boundary between nature and nurture. And this is absolutely fascinating and it's, it's the best part of I think. So you see this great stuff, mm -hmm. and all of this was obtained uh, uh, by a sequence of easy steps, and therefore, somewhere, <laughs> okay, next step very briefly. Johannes Kepel, 2000 years later, he, uh, oh, 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 I forgot to say, the real accomplishment of Pythagoras is that he was first person in history who put numbers into human experience in human feelings, you see, up until Pythagoras, he said, oh, this is nice, and this is not so nice. And he put math in there, in there. This ratio is not n to m. This was the beginning of all times, according to historians of science. You, you, people saw the whole thing before, but this is the beginning of time, but when you put numbers in, the, to the experience. And somebody else who also put cornerstone in, 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 uh, in of science is uh, Kepler, 
who in 1600 uh, uh, AD spent years of his life slaving like a, like a mule without computer, without calculator, without even a slide rule. You know what is a slide rule? <laughs> when, I was, when I was your age, you see, we didn't brag about my laptop or pop top or how we call them, I don't pop. Oh, no, I'm out of it. <laughs> Did all this you know, Google, Apple stuff. No, my slide rule is more precise than your slide rule. This was, <laughs> it was so good. He didn't even have that. So you, you imagine that he took data and he, he take for the brand data when is Mars here and then and there. And out of this with paper and pencil and nothing else. Calculate the orbit. And he discovered that the Mars did not fit Copernicus. Mars did not fit the idea that it goes around the uh, sun in circle as Copernicus assumed. It was a major tragedy. Major tragedy. Because Copernicus was, before he was condemned, he was briefly <laughs> celebrated, like you know, this is great stuff, you know. And for sure he died before he, they could burn him, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and uh, and to, to do this, you see, to do this for 10 years, I think, six years, he, to do, do this. He had to have enormous motivation, and his motivation was completely irrational. <coughs> his motivation was that God can hear the sound which planets make when they go around the sun. And this planet and this planet, and the God created those orbits such that the music of spheres, the harmonia mundi, music of the world, is, is pleasant to his ear. You see, this was his motivation. And he labored, labored, labored after he discovered that the solution is that the trajectory is not a circle but ellipse. And ellipse is indistinguishable for, from circle with small eccentricity, so it was good for other planets, but not for Mars, because it depends on very small. Very small, and this is one, one of the thousands of pages, hundreds of pages, in you know, all his calculations. And now the lesson from this is, so we, this was a revolution in, in astronomy, but in physics. Astronomy is again part of physics, of course. You let them have their department, but that's only because they are so cranky. <laughs> well, in 2012, we, flew, we proved that Kepler was right, because we have a recording of the Earth singing. Yes, 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 uh, yes. And uh, yes, yes, thank you. You know what, what, what is the lesson here? When did Kepler stop his calculations? He didn't stop when his calculation would show that this may be the music which God might like. No, he stopped when his prediction agreed with the experimental data, with the experimental astronomers like Tycho de Brahe. And this was what I call cornerstone of not science, but of the modern science, where falsi falsi uh, falsification of the uh, theories is provided by experimental data. So again, this is a good thing for us in music sense to celebrate Kepler. Now what about Johann Sebastian Bach? Was he a scientist? Was he a learned scholar? Yes. Yes. No. You'll see. <laughs> but, but, yeah, I have to proceed. Well, I would, if I had time, I would talk about the, the Amadeus. How, how many of you have seen the movie Amadeus? Not everybody. Go right out <coughs> after the tomorrow and buy it because it's, it's all wrong. It's absolutely historical nonsense, but it's an invaluable lesson in the nature of genius and the aesthetics of music. It, it's uh, one of my two favorite movies, which start with A. You know, the other one with A? Animal House. <laughs> but, Again, I'm kidding, but not completely. <laughs> <laughs> but genetic phenomena is also, if somebody has questions, I have, I have slides. If somebody has questions, so I can show you about genetic phenomena, but not and now. And there will be time for questions at the end. Hmm? There will be time for questions yeah. at the end. Yeah, but well, we, I still have a lot of things to say. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> but let, let's go to the science part of it, you see. Somebody noticed uh, soon after Bach died that, that the, if you, if you, the people did it quite often in the, those dark ages, you see, Kabbalah, Kabbalah. B is the second letter, A is first, C is third, H is eighth, D 
people say, but it's 14. And they say, didn't I just hear the theme from Kunst der Fuge, which is Art of the Few? How many told it? 14. Mm, this is suspicious and Bach. Bach 14. Then they found different version of the theme, and it's again a 14. By the time they already knew that, that this was the case, you see. They find the third way, and it's 15. I say, ah, 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 but this note clearly shouldn't have been there, you see. <laughs> and this was the typical thing which scientists do, uh, and even scientists, they wanted to fit the data to theory. So when they, when they found 13, they said a missing thing, and before this was done, everybody is absolutely sure that Bach composed governed by the idea that he meant 14. And somebody, mind you, oh heaven, notice that J S Bach, you got J and S, you get 41 numerically. J and S and B and what is 41? It's 14 inverted. Oh, by now it, it was absolutely sure. <laughs> and this is what now, I, I don't have time to, uh, it goes to extremes which are almost painful, they are, it's like tragic comedy, it is, it's funny and uh, tragic at the same time. And I will just tell you the climax of it, some time ago I was involved in trying to persuade some committee, uh, including a student, doctoral student from some university, which will remain mercifully anonymous, <laughs> for, safe, for my safety, you know. <laughs> and this, this person had doctoral thesis in which he discovered why Bach's unfinished fugue, which is the greatest thing <coughs> ever written, ends at the bar 239. At that point, Chopin literally dropped out of bars and he died. Uh, and it's written on Twitter, that's how it went. But it was bar 239, and he wrote it. His, this was the Discovery of the thesis is it was two plus nine. <coughs> because two plus three plus nine is fourteen. <laughs> two plus three plus nine is fourteen. When the bar measure was two hundred thirty six seven eight, when it reached two thirty nine, the fate killed Bach because it's, and it's, so I tried to convince everybody that no two reason about the award doctoral degree for this, but they did. <laughs> That's why they, they anyway. So, so, so my 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 message is that no, he was not a learned physician. He had all those you know counterpoint, right? Counterpoint has many rules. You know what? The, 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 these rules good for Bach. We need to break them. <laughs> if you go and if you if you analyze anything by Bach, there's more broken rules than satisfied, but he, he knew them because broken rules, not unexisting rules, because you are aware, I mean, it's a complicated, we, see, I, I can keep you here for a long time. Uh, like in, in the movie, when well, it's straight, let me stop it. So, okay, so no, I'm a learned musician. Now something which is a uh, very controversial thing, I think he even would have preferred equal temperament. Mm -hmm. Equal temperament. In a theory, I know we are shaking your head because you must. We have a very significant uh, person here. Uh, Greg is building for us the magnificent organ at uh, uh, downtown. And uh, if, if you say what I just said to any organist, you need friends. I hope that I do. <laughs> because each of them believes that temperament is her or, her or his church are the best, and he hates everybody else. Uh, and But they all hate me because I say, all the temperaments are not so good as equal, and I, I will not expand on it, but I, I'm really convinced it's just it was different to two. Because in equal temperaments, everything beats a little bit. You don't have any purity. And if you have purity, you can you know, some, to, to tune some intervals pure, it's easy. You just tune it until it stops beating. And then you temper everything else, so it's okay. But if everything beats, you have to count beats. But the counting beats is very difficult. You see, how do you count 3.7 beats to 3.4 beats? And it's all depends on frequency. It's an iceberg. So I think, but enough, enough. <laughs> <laughs> and no one should not try to complete this unfinished cube. They are fools. I call them fools. And again, I will not name them for my own safety. But some people just try to complete the few in the Bach work, you see, and I think it's not only foolish thing, but it approaches blasphemy. <laughs> mm. And uh, 
the community of this has already you when I wrote it my uh, you will see this on the website actually not today, but uh, on Monday because I'm, you will see it. it is hard to believe that this, after superlatives employed in my discussion of Bach and Fugue so, so far that there would be something even more profound more beautiful and more moving and yet I will argue that the giant unfinished fugue number 14 that's the unfinished fugue which collapses at the bar to, to uh, 39 is pinnacle of Bach's life work if not much of music in general in this single composition Bach looks back at least 150 years and also anticipates music not to be written for another 150 years and he does it with the beauty and wisdom which takes multiple listening to even start to appreciate. That is why an attempt at a completion is preposterous. The problem is not puzzle in counterpoint to be solved, and no one can complete the life of a genius. So you can see I kind of like this kind of thing, you know, <laughs> very deep. And Shaya will be kind enough to read a sentence which I wrote. And you see, you already know how modest I am, right? Because by far the most. But this sentence is so beautiful, I wrote it, that somebody <laughs> with, uh, with, with more beautiful accent than mine must, must, must read it. As in Beethoven's <coughs> Opus 111, where the Arietta theme comes back at the end in its simplest form, and as in Bach's Goldberg variations, where the original aria returns verbatim after all the wonders Bach subjected it to in the variations, so it seems appropriate to repeat the simplest presentation of the Künstler Fugue theme at the end of the Art of Fugue, to fully realize that Bach indeed went much beyond music in this work. He reflected and meditated, and makes us reflect and meditate on the inner wisdom of the heavens and earth. I do like it. It's a sentence. <laughs> <laughs> Where did I learn sentences like this? And Greg will be kind enough to show us where. The letter by Mozart, his sister. I hope, my queen, that you are enjoying the highest degree of health, and that now and then, or rather sometimes, or better still, occasionally, or even better still, qualche volta, as the Italians say, you will sacrifice for my benefit some of your important and intimate thoughts, which ever proceed from that very fine and clear reasoning power, which in addition to your beauty and particularly from a woman, and particularly from one of such tender years, almost nothing of the kind is ever expected. You possess, O oh queen, as abundantly as to put men and even graybeards to shame. <laughs> My brother's never taught to me This is my school, yes. and you should read. You should read. <laughs> <laughs> what, what I find touching that Mozart himself wrote a little postscriptum after the sentence, and it, it, say, now there you have a Walter. <laughs> <laughs> and to complete this, uh, honestly, uh, you know, I also lecture quite a bit about Escher, uh, uh, Douglas of Sutter's. Gerdle Bach, which changed my life about what, 30, 40 years ago. Mm. And uh, this quotation is uh, absolutely irresistible. Greg again. Oh, sorry, Shai again. <laughs> the proverbial German phenomenon of the verb at the end, about which draw tales of absent minded professors who would begin a sentence, ramble on for an entire <laughs> lecture, and then finish up by rattling off a string <laughs> of verbs by which their audience, for whom the stack had long since lost its coherence, <laughs> which be totally nonplussed, are told is, it an, is, an is an excellent example of linguistic pushing and popping. <laughs> so, to conclude this uh, literal expression, I would say, <laughs> famous student of German uh, culture, Mark Twain, a German joke. <laughs> <laughs> And just to really conclude is that Mark Wein also discovered that Wagner's music is <laughs> 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 And we 
Sophia, in Germany, Sophia and Einstein, you all know about Einstein as a scientist, and I, was, uh, I think he should have gotten at least three Nobel Prizes. He only got one for his first discovery. He was not a relativity. He just went to mechanics, which later people accuse him of not understanding. Well, he, again, a lecture on his own, so we will not do this. Not very many people know uh, about that he was a musician, you see, and those people who know that he played violin, they like to think that he was a mediocre violinist. And the reason I think is that people hate it in general, when somebody is too good, too many things. <laughs> they, they, say, they say, oh, okay, he was a great scientist, but a violinist, mm, or oh, as a political scientist, all this peace and pressure, no, no, no. Well, they, they, they even supplement this by stories like uh, they say, well, did you hear about Einstein? He was in a quartet and played with them. And he kept making mistakes. So the first round is finally got upset and say, Albert, can you count? <laughs> Get it? <laughs> <laughs> but there's a story which I want to tell you, which is not well known, but it's genuine. It's not apocryphal. I have a German uh, version of the newspaper in which it is, but it will be in English. Sometimes in the 20s, when he was already famous, but not yet so famous as that everybody would know the name Einstein. Only educated people know Einstein. He came with his violin to a small town in Germany, and he gave a recital benefit for the synagogue in the evening as a charity benefit. And the owner of the newspaper in the town, who was educated, called his music critic, who, was, who didn't know anything about Einstein, and said, Famous Einstein is in town and he plays tonight. Go and write a review. <laughs> so he went to the music critic and wrote a review. Einstein plays excellently. <laughs> However, his worldwide fame is undeserved. <laughs> there are many violinists who are just as good. <laughs> <laughs> I must say, nobody yet has said anything similar about my organ playing, so. <laughs> See, so this shows you, and it's entertaining, and now comes the thing which is not too funny, as in a few people, the, the, the people who know about him being musician know that he was a prophet, and I, uh, because of my kindness, I will spare you uh, books, he wrote the books and books of his articles, and I will just summarize it in one simple sentence, what he said, and the sentence says that nuclear weapons changed everything except our way of thinking. And this he said before he knew anything about molecular biology. I do. And now I would start to scare you with what is possible and what is not possible, uh, and uh, what, but I won't because it's a celebration. <laughs> but you will find a lot of this on my web page eventually, and, and this is a big deal, and we all I will come up a little bit of this at the end, but optimistically. Okay, so now let's go. Let's kind of. Uh, let's go into the questions. Brief summary uh, as of a guide to your readings of thinking or maybe reading my web page, so it will be brief. This we went through. Musical acoustics is an excellent way how to visualize quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics is another hobby. Uh, so many of us have to die soon. <laughs> <laughs> and it's difficult to teach and it's even difficult to understand. And therefore, every way how to visualize it is welcome. And you cannot really visualize it by drawings. But it turns out you can visualize it by music because of the vibration. See, the whole the humongous part, I can spend one third of the quarter of the introductory quantum mechanics on waves only. Well, you have the same thing like with music with the set, you know, the ground state of something is this, the second excited state is this, so everything is the same, but it makes sense. You know, didn't this make sense? Of course. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You see, and therefore it helps, so this is very, very, very nice. But we have to leave it at that. <laughs> Superstream theory, you know what it is? It's a theory which is so difficult that normally when superstring theorist comes to the department and people go, nobody understands what she's talking about. And I say she not because I'm polite, but it was actually a case with she. Brilliant <laughs> superstring theorist came, it was a she, and nobody understood anything. 
I met her in the elevator and as I, I'm honest, I said, we, nobody understood her thing, but we had the pleasant impression that you did. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then Berkeley, Berkeley has hired her away from us, so it was very unfair. <laughs> but you know what it is? It's an idea that which unifies the whole, the whole everything that all elementary particles are modes like this. You know, those modes are simplistic, but imagine that if this vibrates like this, is an electron. If it vibrates like this, it's photon. If it vibrates like this, is uh, antiproton. You see, every elementary particle is different, excited mode of the same thing in this thing. Some people hate it because it's so incredibly difficult because it's happened in 10 dimensions in a floor, and 10 dimensions is no, no fun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I cannot go into this, but uh, again, to, to go to musical illustration, at some point in time, Princeton University had four faculty who were all four experts in string theory, so they called them <laughs> string quartet. <laughs> but since Princeton already had a string quartet, this was the second Princeton string quartet. <laughs> <laughs> so this is two stuff. Music is an excellent example of emergent complexity. You see, and this is a humongous subject which... Uh, <laughs> what is me? Pa, 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 pa. That's good. At least limiting ourselves to Western music. Yet, about 36,000 of them pa, 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 in the right order. And when you put 36,000 in the right order, you get part of you about which I can rhapsodize until cows come home, you see. And the same with this, what am I? I'm one hydrogen atom and a proton and electron around it. If you, have, if you have two or three or four or a million of them, it's still, but if you have 10 to the 27 of them, you can possibly imagine what's in the 27, 10 to the 6 is million, or 9 is the quantity changes in the quality, and you have flowers and people and, and everything else. Emergent complexity, it, it's not more complex, it's the same simple thing like I said, I was talking about simple thing about vibration of this thing, it's the same, but apply the extreme number of things. And the same is this. The same as Job and, <laughs> and the composer proudly brings a guest to the blackboard like this, you see, and on the blackboard there's zillions of notes and mishma, and random notes. Look, my, my new symphony. <laughs> the guy said, oh, but it doesn't make any sense. I said, oh, yeah, yeah, I still have to put them in the right order. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, until complexity can emerge. And then you have Mandelbrot set, of course. If you know, uh, how many of you know about Mandelbrot set? Ah, this would be just perfect for me to talk about it, but I can't. But, <laughs> <laughs> this is it, you see. The whole, the whole Mandelbrot set algorithm, the whole prescription, the, the Unified theory of the Mandelbrot set is right here in those two lines. That's all. You see? And you would expect a blob, and it is a blob. But it turned out to surprise of anybody and everybody that if you zoom on this and this, you get this. If you zoom on this, you get this. And this <coughs> zoom can be proven in the same way like it can be proven that square root of two different ends, this zoom can never finish. So the complexity of the Mandelbrot set, which is generated by the absolutely simple prescription, is infinite and it's again an emergent complexity and this reminds me of the Bach fugue it, 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 this is my, my, my I have appropriated and improved a little bit the piano roll in which you know you have a cylinder piano roll and you unwind it and you will have a rectangle in which time goes this way and pitch goes this way so if you are educated in this you can sing it pa, 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 pa. and you can see I cannot sing but pa, 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 pa. Twice as slow, and you can see the interplay of four voices. Some voices go up quickly and down, and you can see all this at once. You see, you can see this at once, and you can see the distorted version of the theme in the same way. Is the still the same theme, but it's distorted in the same way as this. If you can, you see that this is like this, but it's crooked. Can you see it, it's crooked or is, is it? Yes. No. Okay, you will see that by, this is probably better see that it's crooked. It's not symmetric anymore. You see, all those analogies are there because both, both things are emergently complex. 
And in addition, as I say here, music is an excellent playground for, for the concept of time. Between you and me, nobody knows in physics. Ne nobody knows what is time. If, uh, if you can consider this the greatest mystery, you cannot even pose properly the question, what is it that we don't understand about it? So this shows you that we really don't understand. <laughs> if you don't even know what, we, what it is that we don't understand. And what you experience here is the timeless. Uh, music is of course happens in time. Music without time would not exist. But you can look at this and if you if you have a photographic memory, like some of the people who were brought up on, on the uh, on the languages like Mandarin, you have, you just look at the page and you don't see, you see the whole thing at once. So if you are educated enough about this, you would see the whole thing appreciated. I'm told that Martinu, uh, well, I was not able to ask you, but Martinu is my <coughs> composer at the present, right after that. He wants said about his own opera, that when he remembers it, he remembers it as a single chord. The whole opera is a single chord. He hears everything at once at the same time. And this is extremely valuable to, to explore time, because shredding of picture is a, the wave function changes, and the famous shredding equation tells us how does the wave function change. Will the David equation is the Hamilton is zero of the universe. If the Hamiltonian is zero, this means the rate of change of psi is zero, which means, in plain English, nothing ever changes. And it is similar to this, it's called block universe in which you have x and y and z, which you can forget, and time like this. And you look at this whole cube, all, and you see everything at once, you see at once what happened and all, what will happen and what is in, in the present. And this can be, again, you can prove anything like this. But, but, by this. but you can get a feeling for it by looking at the score in this way. You, you, you can look at the standard score because it could take too many pages, but if you do it this way, it's a whole field. It takes 15 minutes. And you can do it on one page. And you can, you can practice it. So this is fantastic stuff. Uh, music is the exuberance and humility at the same time. Very briefly, for the basic problem, we are two exuberance and, uh, as species. You see? And we must temper, if we want to survive, this exuberance with some humility. And these are two contradictory notions, exuberance and humility. So it's not easy to satisfy both of them, so you have to work on it. The music often teaches you how to do it. As my famous example is here, two organs. This is a St. Mark's organ, uh, which will now get competition from, from uh, different, from a colleague, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, when you play it, uh, 32 feet uh, pipes, you see the, 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 the windows shake and the uh, walls and you feel really like Lord of the Universe and all of our exuberance. And then I once came to uh, College of Milan and Mary and they knew the physics department, give a physics program, and they knew that I always tried to put some physics in my, at the end of my, what, no matter what it is, I put some music, just because that's what I do. <coughs> and they say, you saw there's something else for you, maybe. Maybe instead of a few minutes, uh, at the end of the lecture, you can get a recital in the evening because we have this very, very nice small organ. I, 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 what's so special about it? It, it was built in 1743. Uh, in 1743, Bach was just working on the piece which I absolutely so much about on the art of you. So I did it. You see, and it was an incredible thing. This is not me. <laughs> I'm working on it, but uh, the bear will be, will jump to action. <laughs> but this is a, like abacus of organs. You cannot feel exuberant because it doesn't have even two, two keyboards, it's just one keyboard. No pedal board, it just, and yet it was written, uh, it was built in 1743, and those two feelings, I think, should tell you this well. Enough said. Uh, little skip lazy interferometer space antenna uh, because it was supposed to uh, listen to gravitational symphony of the universe. Again, okay, music analogy. But Mars, tourism to Mars got in the way. Now Congress decided that Americans would much rather see somebody go to Mars. It's more sexy okay, than to investigate <coughs> gravitational waves, so it may not happen. But uh, they needed some analogy because, uh, again, metaphor, because Congress 
this was supposed to go, uh, it was almost one billion dollars. So it, it started, we started with almost some money, right? Billion. So we need some reasons. So they, they invested in the reasons. The symphony of the universe's orchestra, which is the every everyday effect, you are bound to find them in some breath and butter physics, like this and this and this. But then you have some, here is an enormous black hole, which swallowed the black hole here in some other galaxies. Those are the solids. You see? And they picture all of this as orchestra and solids, but they call it universe. Gravitation is in the universe. They still didn't get the money. <laughs> and finally, the symbiosis uh, of music and science helps some musicians to feel better about what they do. <laughs> and this, is, uh, this is something which is kind of you know, I, I used to be part of music faculty also, and I detected that some have a, I don't know, call it physics MD, but they say, oh, but you guys, you do so many useful things, and you are so well supported, and we are just playing, and, and, and you get complete. And this makes them feel better because I, I, I tell them it's not just playing it. it, it music is not a hobby. Even to make it or even to listen to it, it's some vital part of life, you see. And this, well, when they see collections like this, they like it. And finally, the last one is little music makes lecture and science and society less depressing. <laughs> <laughs> because I would not probably hesitate too much to depress you if I wanted to hear time. But if you have a bunch of uh, undergraphs, you see, and if you depress them too much, you never know what they will do. <laughs> yeah, I don't want anybody to go and do something bad, you know. <laughs> so whenever I detect that we are going somewhere too depressed, I, I say, oh, okay, so what about some Bach? And they say, oh, Bach. But it's not too funny for most of them. They would much rather do something else like... Uh, Britney Spears, no, Britney, uh, I, I don't know, Britney Spears, uh, they told me, oh, professor, you are so behind the times, yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I don't even know who they, anyway. <laughs> so so that, that, that's an important thing to, to make the lecture like, much easier. So, final slide, we have a new digital planetarium at the UW. The old one was the classical thing, which is a ball, iron or ball, and they have pin, pinholes. Mm -hmm. And light bulb in it. You see, so the pinholes project stars, and so it's all calculated, and then pinholes slowly rotate, so the moon rotates. It's beautiful. It's beautiful, it's beautiful because the stars are as you see them if you do it properly mechanically, if you break the pinhole, right? You forget that you are in a planetarium. You see, but you cannot do much with it. You cannot travel to different galaxies. So they replace it by Microsoft, big, the big thing, the project ship combination of these six projectors and this and that, and you can do them whatever you want. You can travel to different galaxies, imaginary or real. You can do many things. It's very nice, but you pay the price. Even with most expensive technology, you can do as sharp images as a bit of pinhole. You see, so it's, it, it is. But anyway, I would like to make a show for the planetarium. Uh, People, of course, make shows because it can be no program by computer and it's cool, it's real. They all play this terrible music like uh, metallic kind of <laughs> <laughs> they play some real Bach and I would call my show Bach meets Einstein and Darwin in Andromeda <laughs> <laughs> this is for me the synthesis of the whole thing you see and, and in this spirit I need some kind of slogan for this so, so my final thing is almost like a sermon or I kind of uh, send off sign and music with Bach, Darwin, and Einstein symbolize many aspects and dimensions of infinity and eternity, exuberance and humility, <coughs> and wisdom and hope. Thank you. before we'll um, move into the other room for the drawing and cupcakes and the concert. So now is the time for questions. So if you play, um, just say, A440, for example, on the A444, um, what is causing the beatings? Is it when the sine waves cross? Or what do we perceive as the beats? When you play A440, there should not be any beats. <laughs> 
But if you if you also play 444 at the same time, and you get the beam kind of like what you did, whatever yeah, pitch so it was. So it's like this. If, if, you know, if, if this is 440 and this is 444, yeah. these are four have different beating this and so that's beating. But that's also beating between this because this is harmonic. So if this was 400, this would be 800. If this was 400, uh, four, this would be 808. So you see, it gets very complicated very quickly because the beat rate between this and this is four. Because right. the difference between fundamental of this and this is yeah. 400 for minus 400. But the difference between this and this is eight because this is, so we don't have combination of wow, 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 and wow, 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 and, and this all, the, it, it gets complicated like this very quickly. So is, it the, is the difference between the overtones that you're hearing, or is it the difference between the fundamental Not only between the it's also between the fundamental. As oh, I said, so if it's four, if it, the lowest beat will be between 400 and 404, which is the two fundamentals. Okay. But you will hear everything else. And you will not come with a year, well, this like uh, almost uh, to asking me something which may probably be for, for, for Addressing the question of equal temperament, but I won't. <laughs> I won't today, anyway. So, so you've looked at harmony. Have we thought about, say, the relationship of rhythm and uh, other analogies? And harmony has really nothing to do with rhythm. Yeah, the, 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 you know, melody, harmony, and rhythm are three more or less orthogonal aspects of music. Right? You have music which is mostly melodic, and music which is mostly uh, rhythmic, which I wouldn't call it. And it is again. Thank you for this. It is in the counterpoint, and from counterpoint, especially in the Bach counterpoint, all three aspects are going to be written melody and harmony. Because in counterpoint, as I was showing you, melody goes if time is like this, melody goes like this, and second melody is so it's horizontal. But at the same time, vertically, at any given moment, everything what you hear must be harmonized. And by harmonized, I don't mean consonant. But it must have a function which is either consonant, and then you are pleasantly surprised by dissonance which follows. So it has, uh, or, or vice versa. But you, you see, you have this, and, this, and then they have written it, which it is. And this whole thing is uh, so synthesized in such a way that no aspect gets out. It's all smooth. It, it, it's perfect. From the point, it's perfect. And it was my greatest surprise in my life. I, again, I will put this on my website when I finish it. I, 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 for some strange reason, I went to a jazz concert in one of the venues here, and they played, the pianist played at this song, and they played counterpoint, but so beautiful, so beautifully, that I thought, this is how Bach would have played today, if you like today. So after the concert, I went to see them, I said, you play counterpoint. And they said, what is counterpoint? <laughs> <coughs> this was quite something. And you, you will get to hear, uh, I took a recording of it and they agreed that I can use it. So you will get to hear it. It's, it's mind boggling what can be done. Anyway, so so th this is it. You have different aspects of music. Early in the talk, you mentioned the Bach genetic phenomena. Mm -hmm. There are many, there are many. Disciplines, especially in science, and when, when they have three or four, maybe five brothers or sisters who were, who were gifted. This is something else. This is Bach's family tree, and they plotted only musicians. That they skipped non musicians. <laughs> and they also skipped females because it was a very bad time. And, you know, but, but, Part of his genetic thing was that musicians uh, <laughs> took a wife into the music also, so, so the inner it, but they are not listening. So what I did, because I'm a scientist, I said, let's investigate how it works. I took the year of birth and the death of everyone, and I plotted it horizontally, pa, 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 and then somebody else, and when you do it, what, what am I, this is a histogram, where you have here, like something having something on the horizontal, and number of bucks which lived at the same time, at the time, you see. This, that's what's called Instagram, and this is here. Wow. <laughs> the whole genetic accident, which I, I have never seen by the way this before, yeah, but I should have published this one time ago, but <laughs> it started with one single person, you see, a single person lived from here to there somewhere, 
and then his son who lived for me there, so they overlapped for some time, and then, and this is 31. Yeah. At some point there were 31 mailbags, all together in relatively <laughs> small part of Germany. And yeah. each of them was professional musician. Conductor, composer, trumpetist, organist, whatever. Yeah. And what about the back? The back lift from here yeah. to here. Yeah. He was still, yeah, I have goosebumps. <laughs> I'm really excited about whenever I say this, like, I have seen that. So a lot of happens from that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's how that looks. Um, <laughs> That's just another right answer for you. But the great thing is not always, you, 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 can't, you can't imagine how much I would play for a photograph from a reunion of this with the great Bach presiding <laughs> and hearing them. But unfortunately, we made the civilization great mistake. We had invented the recorder and camera too, too late. It was a terrible mistake what we did. There was no camera. But by 1889, there were already were cameras. And it so happened that one of these guys, one of these guys emigrated to America and established Bach branch, branch of the Bach family in America. Since we already had things, we have a photograph of them. And this is Hermann Brach, August Brach, blah, 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 blah. And look, even the little guy, even the little guy has a little <laughs> <laughs> So this, this, this slide is one of my most treasures for the, again, it's not well known, but it's a very, very, very small part of the whole accident. Like this, like this, it's with a lot of buttons. Can you remember making Edison cylinder? <laughs> Are you flooding only the museums in that in the, the red one? Yeah. Only the yes, yes, because yeah. the, the graph I took the data from only plotted musicians. I didn't have data on non musicians. Sure, it's all the musicians.